In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I acknowledge the Darug people whose land I'm speaking from today. Archive Central began in 2019 and it's one of the ways that we engage across the state. Two other ways we do that is through our regional network and our touring exhibitions. This is the third year of Archives on Tour. We actually visited towns in the first year. Fingers crossed. So we're going to be bringing you archives about the schools and teachers of Ulladulla, Milton and Kubar. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly and I apologise, but we'll just keep going. I'm going to talk about the series and how you can find them on our website and how to access the archives. Out of the literally millions of archives, we've picked just a few to show. Archives on Tour has its own pages on our website, so you can browse the digital versions of the archives we talk about at your own pace later. Where are we going? To these four towns, but today we're in Ulladulla. So this is a plan of the public school site from about 1909. And the school I can see looks like it's pretty much on the same site. The site has just grown and changed over time. Starting talking about two great sources, the Department of Education website includes this absolutely fantastic source, the History of New South Wales Government Schools. You can search for a place name to see if there was ever a school there. And if there was a school, then you can find out what sort of school it was. It also explains all of the different types of schools and provides other background information about education. And then of course our website, New South Wales State Archives. This is where you can find the State Archives about schools and teachers. And many of the State Archives we'll be looking at today were actually created in those schools by the teachers. These are the records that we're going to focus on. There are many other series you could use too if you're interested in schools or teachers, but the school files, photographic collection, teachers' career cards and the site register cards gives you a nice package of both the personal and the official and cover between them probably most of the schools. There's a huge number of schools, there always have been. So in 2020, over 2,000. Since, since 1848, well over 7,000 New South Wales government schools. And there's been 30 different types of schools. But schools reflect and are impacted by a whole range of things. Global events like wars and statewide events like drought and depression. They're involved in and create their own local events and they reflect their locations, coastal towns, dairying areas, railway towns, mining towns, small towns and large towns. The school files were created by bringing together all of the correspondence about each school. It's from everyone, in essence, teachers, parents, the education department, district officers, other government departments, local members of parliament, education ministers, local councils, parents and citizens groups, and other local organisations. The later files, so the files from 1876 to 1939, cover a huge wealth of information about schools and the teachers. But the later files from 1940 onwards don't contain quite as much detailed information about teachers. And they're also more official in tone because as we go through this, you'll discover the earlier school files are often anything but official in tone. These are the schools that we're going to talk about. Most of these schools, as you can see, are still open and going strong. And they reflect their times, both World Wars, but particularly World War I. Women having to resign if they marry in the 1930s, the depressions, expanding and decreasing populations, but they also reflect their town. The school files show that these schools are in daring, dairy farming areas and also that they're coastal. As Ulladulla and Milton grow in population and area, so does the need for schools and the type and size of the schools they need. Some of the school files are up to about 15 boxes of paper. Some are much smaller, only a couple of centimetres. I've just selected for a very small quantity of papers to look at 
today, there's a bigger selection, but still only a selection on the Archives on Tools School Records page. I'm going to start with Ulladulla as the first school that started. It seems to have commenced in the School of the Arts building in 1861 under the earlier school system. In 1877, the parents petitioned for a school building and school residence, and this is part of that petition. So I've just snipped a few bits of that petition so I could show them to you. Although they said that they'd like the site to be for the school to be chosen by the local inspector of schools and the local board, no sooner was the site announced and they said they didn't like the site that was chosen. It was actually that site where the school is now. More reasonably, they didn't like the idea of repurposing the courthouse, which I think was a sound idea. In 1877, a new school and teacher's residence was approved. The inspector didn't foresee any increase in population, as you can see at the top of the image on the right hand side. Population of the school will be permanent, but not likely to increase. And the school was planned to suit the enrolment of 50 children, as you can see on the other side. There should be a teacher's residence consisting of four rooms, including a kitchen, and as shown on the plan. This was the plan that followed that petition. I'm not sure that it is exactly the plan, but it's still a great informal sketch. So this is on the left that accompanied the report and shows you clearly where it is. There's the road to Milton and there's the road to the harbour. And there's a residence which is adjoining the schoolroom and a veranda. veranda. That veranda plays a large part in the history of the school in one way or another. And then there's, I've also shown a more formal map of where the school was or the, where the school was to be. And that's adjoining the Catholic church and school. This is from September 1883. It seems that no sooner than Ulladulla had got its school than it outgrew its school. Space in the residence was complicated at this point by the fact that the teacher had 10 children. And you can see from that great little sketch plan, there's two bedrooms in this house. One of the documents that I didn't copy said that five of the children were sharing the same bedroom as their parents. What else would you do? One of the departmental officers did think to ask how many children were still living with the teacher. I think that was hopeful that they didn't have to accommodate them all. But more practically, how many of each sex were the children? And ultimately, they agreed that the teacher's residence is too small, needs to be enlarged. Um, if the present teacher is to remain in charge, recommend that a weather shed be built at a probable cost of £47, that two rooms be added to the present residence to be built of stone at a cost of about £170. By October 1883, the contentious issue was the weather shed, not the additions to the residence. As you can see at the top of the page, is a weather shed absolutely necessary, underlined in blue. It was decided it wasn't, as the building had verandas. Something to keep in mind is that the works on the school buildings were often carried out by local builders. And the school files can provide information about local businesses if you have the time to look. There'll often be tenders provided by the local builders. If things, and this is common in government records, if things didn't go well, you might get a lot more information about the build was held up or there was a problem with supply. And then looking at the bottom part of the document on this page, I concur in Mr. In Mr. Well, with Pitt's recommendation as to the addition to the teacher's resident, but as regards a weather shed, I recommend that one not be erected underlined in red. The school is possessed with a veranda. And obviously that was just going to have to do for the children in wet weather. More seriously, there was an outbreak of typhoid in Ulladulla in 1889. I haven't done extensive searches, it, but it didn't, it didn't sort of seem to me like this was a huge outbreak. 
The facts of the case are simple, are simply these. Mr W Evans, a teacher at the public school at Ulladulla, has been very seriously ill for five weeks with typhoid fever. His apartments join the school room. Hence, the annoyance is great to the sufferer. The parents object to object to send their children to school fearing the contagion. So the attendance had dropped dramatically and they were suggesting that possibly the school could be moved to the School of the Arts temporarily. That doesn't seem to have happened. But as you can see from this telegram that Mr Evans actually died from typhoid. I had a quick look for a death notice and found one in the newspaper on Trove. He was only 35 at the time when he died. On a more positive note, Arbor Day, and this is a day that some of you might remember, your parents talking about possibly, it's a day about encouraging individuals and groups to plant trees. Arbor Day has been observed in Australia since 1889. And in 1890, the new teacher at Ulladulla Public School was planning on adding quite a few trees to the school grounds. I now beg to make application for a grant of 25 trees of the following description. Six Norfolk Island pines, they're large trees. Four cypress pines, four bunya bunya pines, two camphor trees, three pepper trees, two English oaks, and four others of a suitable kind. So that would have been quite a wooded grounds. Over time, there was a range of ways to become a teacher. But up until about 1905, most teachers in government schools were trained on the job as pupil teachers. They usually began their four year course between the ages of 13 and 16. During school hours, the pupil teachers taught a class full time. And each day out of school hours, they're instructed in teaching method and content by the head teacher. Reports on pupil teachers are often found in the school files. In some of the areas, I find quite surprising that they had to report on. So they had to report on health. It should be stated whether the pupil teacher suffers from any physical infirmity likely to interfere with the discharge of duty. So this report on Miss Rose Norris says the pupil teacher, Miss Norris, seems perfectly healthy and not any symptoms of failure of the heart have been marked since her appointment. On the contrary, leave of absence has not been obtained since appointment. And then their conduct out of school, special reference to be made to moral character as evidenced by the persons chosen as associates and the model of spending leisure time, mode of spending leisure time. Moral character seems good insofar as I am able to judge. And I'm of the opinion that her leisure hours are spent in trying to assist her parents who are not in the best of circumstances. I think that Miss Norris probably passed the test to be, continue to be a pupil teacher. Teachers were moved from school to school frequently, sometimes at their request or as a promotion, but more often just I think as the way they chose to run the school system. Travelling expenses were paid, but as you can see from this example, blue ticks, but in some cases with a cross, they didn't always get paid all of the expenses they claimed. Here in 1910, Thomas King and family is being moved from Leech's Gully near Tenterfield to Ulladulla, about 900 kilometres. And this is in 19, oh yes, in 1910. The journey was a bit like the movie Trains, Planes and Automobiles, but just with trains, buses and coaches instead. So you can see railway from Tenterfield to Nowra, and then I presume it's actually a bus fare from Nowra to Bomaderry, coach fares from thence to Ulladulla. Oh, actually it would have been a train to Bomaderry. I think he's got confused. Um, breakfast, dinner and tea en route, but also all of the furniture traveling with them. So the furniture consisted of a piano, bedroom suite, bedstead, dining room suite, sideboard, table, wire mattresses, chairs, linoleum, two cases of household linen and books. He's a teacher after all. So this is a teacher's career card. This is Thomas King's teacher career card. This system of cards began around 1908 and continued until 1987. Thomas King was employed before these cards started and you can see in the top right hand 
top left hand corner just near the word king four and then a colon 312. So there was an earlier system called the teacher's roles. They cover 1869 to 1908. The first number's the volume and the other numbers are the page number. So there's an index to the teacher's roles on our website. They've also been digitised and are available through Ancestry. So this shows, I guess, the latter half of Thomas King's career. You can see there is some confusion about his date of birth, which they've decided is the 5th of December, 19, uh, 1871. That's been proved. And that he left Leech's Gully. So, and you'll see this at various times that they'll cross out the school they've left. And also that it says there are two teachers of this name. A very important thing to do if you're trying to keep an accurate record of the people. He arrived in Ulladulla in October 1909 and probably it looks like moved on to Karamba in, uh, in 1911. And then you can see he retired in 1933, but he'd actually passed retirement age two years earlier. And that's why you can see in this, the back of the card, the services retained for 12 months from his 60th birthday. Teachers requested leaves of absence for a wide range of things. Here, Tessa McCourt on the left has requested leave to travel to see her seriously ill brother who's in Narrabri. And then on the right, because she says, says telegram attached as her proof of her reason, it's a classic telegram, don't waste money. Heck, seriously ill, just a hope, come if possible, arch. And this is Tessa McCourt's teacher career card. She actually died while still quite young. She was born in 1890 and died in 1931. She taught at Aladala from October 1917 to January 1920, having been at one, two, three, four, five, about six schools beforehand, and another six beyond that. So a lot of travelling in their lives, a lot of movement, a lot of making new connections. And having to have a home somewhere to go back to and also somewhere to live while you're in the town where you are teaching. The range of business a school and the department had to deal with is sometimes breathtaking. In 1921, this is on the left, the navigation department donated a flagpole from the Wardenhead Lighthouse to the school. This is just one page of the 15 pages of correspondence about this matter because it had to be moved, it had to be erected, there had to be approval for it to be taken on board. And then on the right in 1920, they were grappled with the issue of grazing horses in the playground before rejecting it on safety grounds for the children. The teacher had already built an enclosure for the horses. So the children who lived less than a mile from school rode to school and that was because after school, they rode to a farm three miles away to work and they leave the school at three o'clock for that purpose. And they had to have somewhere to put the horses in between. There's only mention of Mrs. Robinson. So I'm wondering whether there isn't a Mr. Robinson. It was really necessary for them to bring in an income for the, to support the family. The local show was often a day off school, but in this case, as you can see from the letter from the council, the governor was coming to open the show. And so the pupils were needed to form a guard of honour. Albert Morris, who was the headmaster in 1928, took leave. And in this case, it was to attend the funeral of Mr. A. Reid, who was the late teacher of Burrell Public School. You can see that the leave was approved and this is quite a common thing, that last paragraph. The school was kept in operation, my duties being carried out by Miss Evans, assistant teacher. It's always important, was, it was always important for them to put that information in, who was going to manage what needed to be done. So who just left the school at 11 to attend the funeral? I'm sure that all of the teachers in the area would have known each other quite well. There was a continual need for alterations. Some took place and some didn't. 
So we've now moved on quite a way. This is now in 1962. And in the top left-hand corner, the P Parents and Citizens Association viewed the situation as acute. The hall being used at present, beside being completely separated from the school, is unlined and unsealed, sealed with open eaves. So it is entirely cold and damp during the winter months. And they realise the difficulties being experienced by the department, but feel that this is a special case worthy of priority. Their message was heard, and you can see below that, that additional accommodation was approved in 1962. Funds were approved in, and this shows from other correspondents on the whole, the funds were approved in 1964, the buildings were built and occupied in 1966, and it was all completed by March 1966. More land was needed. And so in the mid 1960s, that was achieved. So the little plan here shows the existing primary site and outlined in red, the red that was going to be resumed. And then there was the possibility of that part of Camden Road below Millard's Creek being closed so that there wasn't a road in the middle of the um, playground. So Crew Bar is the smallest school of the three and the one that is no longer open. The establishment of the schools at Crewbar and Milton was shaped by rivalry in the 1860s and 1870s. There are pages, pages, probably literally hundreds of pages of school file about it. What I digitised and it's on the web page is the 21 page inspector's report about which should be the main school and this is just the little bit from the beginning of the report. I think it kind of has the tone of people that are a bit tired of the, um, of the confusion and the discussion. I have the honour to state for the information of the Council of Education that I lost no time in proceeding to the District of Ulladulla. The subjoined report may appear lengthy, but the circumstances are extraordinary and is absolutely necessary to give a full history of the case. My object being to show how by a series of errors, the council has been brought into a position of unexampled difficulty. And I think that possibly the local historians and family historians of the area will know better than I do that in essence, there were two estranged brothers who lived in the two different places. The report's there for your perusal. It includes this absolutely fantastic map of the whole of the area um, with an indication of the sorts of things that would have some impact about where or not the school would be. Later on in the mid 1870s, Crewbar School was replaced by Crewbar Reserve School. The first teacher was appointed in 1876 so a government teacher that is, and that's Mr. David B. Edwards. He's going to be the teacher of the public school at Crewbar Reserve. I have to inform you that the school was duly opened by him on the 18th instance with 28 children in attendance. So it's not a bad number for a small school. The report on the start of Crewbar Reserve, just like Ulladulla, the population is considered um, to be permanent, but not likely to increase. So you could say that like Aladar, one of the two were right, but not both. As early as 1884, you're starting to feel the common theme, I'm sure. There was a list of repairs required to the residents. Mr. Richardson, who was the teacher, was particularly keen to have the repairs done, as you can see at the bottom of him, his letter, as he would be bringing his bride to live there after the midwinter break. So some of it is repairs and some of it's a little bit more decorative, that the walls of front rooms be either papered or coloured and that paintwork be cleaned or repainted, that the locks on the doors be repaired and that the fence around the dwelling be paled and that there would be a large gate put in. Mr. Naley was invited to take over the school in 1885, and it mentions in that telegram that um, as soon as possible, a reasonable sum will be granted for travelling expenses from Sydney. Well, the travel expenses that Mr. Naylor put forward were considered to be too much, and he is now trying to explain 
why the expenses or what the expenses covered. The number of fares included in the charge of £6.17 shillings and sixpence for conveyance by steamer from Sydney to Ulladulla was seven, four full, full fares and three half fares. Under freight by steamer is included the cost of conveyance from Sydney to Ulladulla of my furniture, kitchen utensils, books, etc. Also had to pay 10 shillings for conveyance by coach and then he had to remain in Aladala from midnight of Friday till the afternoon of Saturday. And so under the expense of a pound for board and lodging, our family is nine in number. There's a gap in the records for Kruba with one part of the school file ending in 1890, although it continued as a public school until 1934. And the second part starts in about 19, 1934. Kruebar is continued as a subsidised school beyond that date. So what does subsidised school meant? That it was designed for localities where the minimum attendance required for even the smallest type of government school could not be met. So the department would pay a subsidy for each pupil, but the parents were totally responsible for providing the school buildings and the teacher. It was often though that the subsidised schools were permitted to use former government school buildings, which makes perfect sense of course, but they're not government schools and not included in the schools database on the Department of Education website. And there is not necessarily the same level of information about them in um, the school files. So here, you can see a lot of red underlining I've recommended that steps be taken towards having the children conveyed to Milton at seven pence per child per day, a cheaper proposition than maintaining a larger subsidised school. The buildings may therefore not be needed next year. It is an old brick structure, quite unsuitable for transfer. So when the buildings, the school buildings were built off weatherboard, they actually did relocate them and move them around the state according to need. Um, and I have an opinion that nothing whatsoever would be gained by keeping it in repair. So not, not a fan of having a school there. In 1939, Leonard Kay, who was the headmaster of Milton Public School, is used to report on the, the Kruba subsidised school. So he's the person on the ground, the closest person on the ground, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so at this point in 1939, no action has been taken to engage another teacher. Both promoters and present teacher appear to be satisfied with present arrangements. Only action taken with regard to conveying children to Milton is that the bus proprietor has said that he will do it. None of the children lives within two miles of my school. And you'll see as we go through this two miles and three miles was sort of the measure that they were using that they considered it was reasonable for the children to have to travel. He's then included this absolutely fantastic list of the students. He gives us their name, their age and the class that they're in. And then as he said in pencil on the left, the distance from the Milton School. So there are children from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight families. So it's not, a, not an unreasonable number. The end did come though, and the subsidised school finished in 1943. On the school file, there's a couple of extra pages where they're just sort of, no, it still hasn't been reopened. No, that still hasn't been reopened. So by 1946, ceased to operate. Um, residence appears to have been left by the resumed property department from about 1939. And recently approval has been given for the demolition of the school building where the shed and lavatories and then the land could be let or put up for sale. There's still from time to time claims are made that there are children coming on in an area between Kruebar and the mountains, but they have not been mentioned recently. Might be some small development in that area at some future date and a site at or near Kruebar might be needed. But in essence, at this stage, they're thinking that it's not really needed to be kept on. So which brings us to Milton, the school which did succeed. The local board, this is a letter of confession from them really, the local board caused Milton school to be closed on show day in 1880 
even though they knew closing was contrary to the Council of Education's instructions. So I think they decided to do the job and then admit it later. Times did change and in most cases. I've found as long as you only closed for one local show across the state, that seems to always have been acceptable. These two, the letter and the, um, uh, the addition by the head, cover what must have been a really common problem around the state. So teachers were expected to apply for leave if they were sick and usually to have some sort of medical certificate. So in this case, um, the assistant teacher, Lena Murray, has the honour to inform you that I was compelled to absent myself from duty from the 1st to the 6th of March for school days on account of a severe attack of blight, which incapacitated me from the performance of duty. And she wants her leave to be sanctioned. And then there's a note from the head, Mr. McDonald, where he says that, um, that you know, she was reduced to a condition of almost total blindness. There is no qualified medical man within 45 miles of Milton to certify to her condition. She was, however, far from well, even on her return to duty. Milton School, of course, was surrounded by farms in 1885, and many were dairy farms. With the best of intentions, the teacher there at the time decided he would rearrange the hours so that the school finished at 3 p.m., which was when many children already left to help with the milking at their parents' requests. Rather than move the school day from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. to 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., he shortened the lunch break from an hour to half an hour. These are the notes from the local inspector to the district inspector explaining whose fault all of this was after a parent had complained about the shortened lunch time. In essence, the local inspector had suggested that moving the day forward half an hour would have worked better and not cutting the sacred one hour of lunch break. In this case, the child had had to go home for dinner and didn't have time to get their dinner and get back to school on time. In the 1880s, most if not all women resigned when they were married. These letters from Elizabeth Priscilla Jackson are just an example of the letters and the details of the lives of the teachers in the school files. So she writes on the left, I have this day sent in my resignation, and that's on the right hand side, as assistant teacher in Milton Public School as I am about to be married early in January. As my sole relations in the colony are resident in Sydney and it's necessary to make several arrangements in cooperation with them, requiring more time than the vacation gives me, I've applied to you officially for an extra week. May I ask that you'll kindly give it your early attention so that I may be relieved from suspense in the matter. This absolutely great plan was created in 1890. And as far as I can tell from the file, it was really produced to try and sell some land to the Department of Education. But it gives you a lot of information. So the school area is the ready colour, second from the top. Quite a lot of information about what was happening around that, um, that area. So there's Wasson Street, which is not in use as a street at present, um, part of Grassy Paddock whereas someone called Cambridge owned the land, which was actually a grassy paddock, but it sounded like he was using the road as well. Then there was a grass paddock with buildings on it. So lots of detail. Before I'd ever looked at a school file, I would have said, no, you wouldn't find that sort of thing. But now I know you could find anything in a school file. Throughout school files, applications for new schools are fairly routine. Some are successful and some are not. These are just some images from an 1892 local inspector's report on an application for a school at East Milton. The applications are really quite good because they will often give detailed information about the people in the area who had um, school aged children or close to school aged children. The site was less than three miles from three established schools and all of the potential students already attended a school less than two miles from their home. So in essence, the application was doomed to fail. As it says down the bottom um, of the 40 children, 
the possible average attendance. How many of these live within two miles of some existing school? All of them. How many of these attending existing schools? All of them. But it does give us this absolutely fantastic map which sets out where all of the families that they're talking about lived. So this is the road from Milton at the top, of course, and the road to Ulladulla and beyond below. The Arbor Day approach in Milton was different in 1892 to that in Ulladulla and took the fairly common route of asking people, local people, presumably mostly parents, to subscribe. But here's a list of the people and the money that they donated. The person right at the bottom of the list, Hazelwood, is actually the school teacher of the time. So in all, they raised £10.5 shillings, I would say. Just not a bad effort. Um, I would have provided quite a few trees. This plan from 1898 accompanied one of the regular lists of repairs needed. And actually, if you look at the top and the bottom of the playground, there are ornamental trees all around the outside, outside the guard fence. It's a great plan of what was there at the time. As you can see, unlike Ulladulla, the residence is very nicely separated from the actual school buildings. Um, there are play sheds, separate ones for boys and girls. Uh, WCs for both the teacher, the girls and the boys on completely opposite sides of the playground but a huge amount of detail. And here is one of those lists of the additions needed to the school building, the weather shed, the playground and the residence and the fences. So in all, there's about 25 points of things that need to be done. Some of them are repainting, simple like repainting. Um, others are more substantial, new wooden steps to the girls' portion of the weather sheds, repairing the guttering and downpiping and relaying underground pipe to the bathroom. So a whole range of things. The ministers from the Church of England, Congregational and Methodist churches wrote to complain in 1913 that there were no Catholic children attending Milton Public School, but all of the teachers were Catholic. The planned response, because this is the notes take, someone took to send through to the Under Secretary to produce a letter to send back, was fairly robust, starting with the department makes no inquiry as to the religious denomination of its teachers and removals cannot therefore be made on such grounds. Now, if you think about the teachers' career cards we've already seen, there's no question about religion. There were, I think, on the earlier school roles, but the world had moved on by then. The usual Empire Day celebration, which was held on the 24th of May and honoured the British Empire with some sort of patriotic activity, um, was went ahead as usual in 1913, but not on Empire Day. Very cleverly, it was moved to to the Wednesday, which was the local half holiday, so that more people will be able to be involved. Um, it was going to take the usual form, so addresses and a musical item at the school, a procession to the recreation ground, a picnic, sports and distribution of articles, which would be some books. William Healy was the headmaster at Milton in 1913. He had been a teacher for a long time and continued teaching until he was 65. And again, you can see that he had an entry in the teacher's roles. He was born in 1862, he was married and had come to Milton. And then not always really very good at recording when, but I would guess around 1908 and moved on to Albion Park in 1914. The back of the card under nature of service, you get a whole range of different things. There will often be, as you can see here, that they retain the services for another 12 months beyond whatever the retirement age is at the time. Um, there was a complaint by a fellow teacher and the notes fairly terse about it's got to not happen again. Oh, sorry, looking at the wrong one, about the punishment of her daughter. 
and some defects on inspection. During the war years, all of the school files often have these sorts of requests. So on the left, you can see a request from one of the assistant teachers to be able to have leave to go and see a brother before he goes to the front. And then in a happier frame, um, the headmaster, Mr. Redfin, is asking for leave in 1919 so that he can go and meet his son coming back from the First World War. The ordinary life of the schools continued though, and true also of the communities in some ways. So the minister visited in 1918 and was asked by the PNC for a seventh and eighth grade at Milton. In 1921, the PNC wrote to the department asking for a teacher to carry the children on to an intermediate standard. So the intermediate standard was a little bit like our sort of school certificate year 10 kind of level. The 1920s saw two big events in Milton. As you can see, this wonderful letterhead, there was a home to Milton event held in 1924, when all of the local schools were closed for the day. Originally, they'd only given permission for Milton to close, but Yatti, Krubar, Ulladulla, Burrell, Termal, I think it is, and Coyola all got to close as well. And then the way the headmaster writes in 1927, Mr. Christensen, the school here bears the date 1877. It's like, you know, he's walked past that building with the date on it for all of the time he's probably been there. This year, therefore, will complete 50 years since erection. It's not really clear exactly what they did, but he did want some information about when it was um, erected and when it opened. And you can see the return letter it was erected in 1877 and the first teacher entered on duty on the 1st of April, 1878. The anniversary year didn't Mean that Milton got an additional assistant in, eight, in 1927. In this case, it's the local member writing to the Under Secretary of the Department of Education because he'd been approached when he was in Milton, quite possibly to do with the anniversary of the school, maybe. And you can see in the top left the numbers of the pupils is 105 pupils with three teachers, and the teachers are all teaching three grades and that they really need another assistant. On the other side, part and parcel of the wives of male teachers. Many of them became sewing mistresses. In some areas, it appears that they had to seek exemption from to not be the sewing mistress, though in larger towns, there was certainly a trend for it not to be the head's wife who became the sewing mistress, but to give that opportunity to someone else. So headmaster Leonard Kay applied for permission for his wife to teach sewing in 1939 and provided a detailed list of the pupils who would be taught, all girls, of course. I presume that the numbers after their names are their ages, so eight years and five months. So again, another record of who's there, where they've progressed to in their schooling. So this is Leonard Kay's career card. He continued to teach after retirement as a casual, as is often the case. One of the things that you'll find on the back of the card, so under nature of service, as here, is a lot of detail about the marriage. Married to Miss E.M. Middleton, who appears used to be a teacher, by the Reverend H.S. Begbie, Church of England at Chatswood on the 23rd of December, 1929. They actually had to send in a copy of their certificate, wedding certificates to prove that they were married. In some cases, it just says simply that they're married in a year, but sometimes you'll get this level of detail. You can also see that Mr. K had obviously applied to join the AIF in 1941 but was rejected as medically unfit. And his long teaching career and the whole range of places that he's been. So Milton is about midway down below zigzag. So he arrived there in November, 1938 and left in March, 1941, where he was heading for Warialda. 
the 1940s were focused on getting adequate secondary schooling for the area. Pupil numbers were exceeding the number of staff available to manage that adequately. So you can see the number of staff they had and the teachers available. So none of the special primary teachers had three free periods except for Miss Kirkland who spends 40 minutes each week on vocational guidance work. It's not exactly a free period, I wouldn't think. Um, Milton Public School became Milton Central School in 1944, providing secondary education. Space was also a very big problem and the old remedy of hiring a hall was back on the back as an option. So someone had suggested the Methodist Hall, that was ruled out. The Salvation Army Hall could be bought. They could acquire some adjoining land. Um, that the hall be removed from the present site and re-erected at the school. Um, they can move the weather shed from Crew Bar and re-erected here. In the end, really, what they needed was more land or another site. These are excerpts from a really long letter from the parents and citizens to the Minister for Education in 1945. The anger and frustration that they feel about the situation is really very clear. Parents here are most dissatisfied with the lack of accommodation. They're forced to send their children to school under threat of a fine, but when they arrive at school, they're forced to sit on the floor. I understand that 57 children are in the infant section in a room which has seats for 42. 15 have to sit on the floor. We can't send our boys away as board is unprocurable in Sydney, Wollongong and Nowra. Would like to know why nearly every schoolroom Eden to Wollongong has manual training classes for boys and home science for girls, and there are no classes here. With the exception of Bega and Nowra, Milton is the biggest school on the South Coast, and we feel that visiting manual training and home science teachers should be appointed in the new year. Surely country children should not be so handicapped as to concentrate on learning with a teacher talking and instructing another class. That is difficult to overcome, where at other schools, children are being prepared have no such inconvenience. There were only two small tanks, seldom full, and so nearly 200 pupils at the school, some of whom reside nine miles from the school and some ride to school, and at times they were without water. And this is in 1945, the running out of water, not uncommon in some inland places earlier, the municipality of Ulladulla wrote to the Minister of Education in 1948 in support of the PNC with statistics regarding the growth of the area. So they could report on the building activity. So in the past two years, there'd been new 12 new dwellings approved in Milton, 63 in Ulladulla and 19 in Burrell. And the number of existing dwellings in the municipality is approximately as follows, 200 in Milton, 200 in Ulladulla and 100 in Burrell. You can find so much information in school files about all sorts of aspects about the town. The preparation for Ulladulla High School starts in 1959 when a site is selected. You'll be pleased to see down the bottom on the left, that the situation is healthy and pleasant. Um, it's private land and a proposed road are going to be used. There's tank water at present. Town water supply is expected in five to eight years. It's thinly timbered land. Um, there is some crown land. And the recommendation is that this area be acquired by the Department of Education to allow for future expansion in connection with the Ulladulla Public School. The slight selector was adjacent to Ulladulla Public School, and so the 1960s were spent planning and investigating who owned the land, could it be bought. The principal of the public school, um, Kelsey Snowden, helped. So again, the local person on the ground actually taught pretty much, you know, his school's just right there. Um, so the principal of the school has ascertained that the residence is led at the present time for the sum of three pounds, 10 shillings per week. 
Lot 7 and 8 are improved and the residences are occupied by the respective owners. The owner of Lot 7 states it should be prepared to sell as long as she was not hurried. And the owners of Lot 8 state that they do not wish to leave the property but would consider selling if the price offered was sufficient to allow them to purchase or build a similar residence in a suitable locality in the area. The land was acquired, not quite as much as they had hoped, but not enough. So I think the people at Lot 8 didn't get offered as much as they'd hoped. And so Ulladulla High School was established in 1974. As you can see, the address at that stage was the Milton Central School until the school was built and available in 1976. So how do you find the school files? There's two ways. There's an index to them on our website. So you can follow those instructions, click on the online indexes, S for schools, scroll down to the schools and related records index and just basically search for a town name and it'll bring up the schools and any other school related records that we hold. The school files are listed as administrative files, but you can also search in collection search, just type the name of the town and the word school. Now we've been undertaking a large digitisation project and part of, for part of that we took a poll and got people to vote for what school files they look completely, want to completely digitised. And those schools and, and files are now up, so it's about 100 boxes of school files. And you'll come across them if you're looking, you find one of those. None of Milton, Ulladulla or Kubar were among those. The site register cards, which cover 1930 to 2000, are basically because there have been thousands of school sites over that period. As with Ulladulla High School, a site may take time to acquire and there's no need for it to be used immediately. And sometimes sites are acquired and are never needed. Or with Kubar, it was quite some time after the school closed where they decided, no, really, we don't think we're going to need it. So this is snips out of the um, site. So they're basically, they're just one card. Sometimes there's a map on the back. Gives you a little plot of where the land was, right beside the burial ground. Um, and the Kubar, the, so this is Kubar, reserve site. The Kribar site was not far from this. And you can see that it was given up in June 1958 and it was sold and to a Mr Davies, I think it is. To find them, because they're all listed online, you just need to type in the series name or site register and the town name. The cards aren't digitised, but there's something that you could come and view if they're open. The photographic collection. It's an amazing collection of photographs. It was collected, this is quite unusual for our state archives, collected by the history unit of the Department of School Education, as it was called at the time, from around 1963 through to about 1991. And basically it was to help them when they were preparing school histories or researching for public relations reasons or giving presentations. Many of the photographs are not official photographs. They vary in subject, title, and image quality and size. There aren't photographs for all schools. And if I'd looked before I started working on these schools, I would have rejected it because there's very few, unfortunately, for um, Milton and Ulladulla. There's one photograph for Ulladulla and there's two for Milton. So we have this photo for Ulladulla, which at least it's labelled. So it was obviously donated or came through Mrs Kelsey Snowden, the headmaster of Ulladulla Public School. It's part of a concrete covered stone, apparently a step unearthed behind the stone building at Ulladulla School in September 1960. Fascinating. And then these wonderful photos of Milton Central School in 1962. Very much everyone washed and brushed in their best uniform and best behaviour, but a good record of the time. To find them, all you need to do is go to our website and either just type in the town of, name of the town and then select digitally available 
or type in the series number NRS15051. Um, all of the photographs are digitised, some of the more recent ones which were closed when we first did this are not online yet. But most are there and they'll be progressively going on. In 1851, there were 39 teachers in New South Wales schools. In, by 2015, there were over 54,000 teachers in New South Wales government schools. So if you think of all of those years of education in between, how many thousands of teachers there would have been, and particularly because women teachers did um, resign in most cases, the perpetual need for more teachers. So you recognise Milton Central School on the left. The image on the right is actually from Binaway Public School. It's the two contrasts from quite official photos to not official photos and that just gives you an example of the sorts of things that you might find. Teachers usually spent around three years in a school before being moved. Some stayed much longer, some died as we've seen in service. Women left once they married in the early years, basically by choice and or convention. In the 1930s actually legislated that women must resign when they married. So the act came in in 1932 and wasn't repealed until 1947. Male teachers, particularly married male teachers, were often favoured and requested by local people. But finding adequate accommodation was sometimes very difficult, particularly if they had families. It was also difficult in some places for single female teachers to find suitable accommodation. And there's some records of, you know, the local hotels not wanting them to stay there. That wasn't really the clientele that they were wanting to have to worry about. And the teachers having to board with local families, which sometimes worked well and sometimes didn't. So the teacher career cards cover 1908 to 1987. There's a 50-year closure, so the records have to be more than 50 years old before you can see them. And as you've seen, they detail the appointments in their career plus other detailed information. So here are just another couple of examples. So this is Annie King. So she was trained at Hereford House in February to July 1915. So Hereford House is one of the first teacher education institutions. Unsurprisingly, poor Annie King was only one of three teachers with that name. She was born in 1896. Um, and as you can see, she was granted sick leave in 1949, so she's at least still teaching until then. Sometimes feel, and it's not unreasonable, this is a huge collection of records, not every single thing has survived. So about two thirds of the way down, you can see when Annie King was at Milton, arriving in August 1929 and leaving in May 1933 to go to Urana Quinty out west. She, in her career, was at a huge number of schools all around the place. The column that you see, so the column on the right hand side is the salary that the teacher is being paid and that reflects their level of experience and training, but also passing inspections. The column next to it is class, and that refers to the class of schools. So you can see that Bimboka and Bundanoon are both fifth class schools, as is Ulladulla, whereas and Albion Park, whereas Ride was a third class school. So the higher, the lower the number, the higher class school it was. This is the career card for Gerard Van Eppen, who was born in 1889. He's married, obviously got married. See how the S was under single has been crossed out, married while he was in. So he started with the department in 1908 and worked at Lismore, but resigned in 1910. Presumably did something else but then decided to come back and was re-employed in 1923. So his time at um, Kruba was in 1930 and he was there until 1933. Interestingly, he worked in the correspondence school twice and 
Again, the information about his marriage to Miss Kay Reeves is included. Finding the teacher's career cards, they're not listed by name on our website. So you could either pre-order to view them in the reading room and you'd do that by using NRS 15320 and the teacher's name, but you can also order a copy through the Professions and Occupations Cards copy service for $25. And there's links to our copy service on our website. Just to wrap out, do check out the archives onto your other Dalla School Records page. And last couple of images from, this is from the Milton Public School file in 1923, showing the um, renovations that we're going to make to the schoolroom. A lot of the schoolrooms had tiered floors. And then in a period, I think around the 1920s, they went through and they virtually took out all of those tears.